Hi, everyone. It's really great to be here um, and very fun to be participating in the Day of Space and following on uh, the last Zoe's talk and the previous talk. Um, <clears throat> so we are, um, we are pioneering the moon. Um, we are, uh, I'm talking as a co-founder uh, and vice chairman and chief strategy officer of Moon Express, um, a, a new uh, startup company about five years old now um, with a very ambitious vision. Um, we're building a robot to go and land on the moon. And our goal is to be, uh, well, initial goal is to be the first uh, private organization ever to land on a foreign body. So um, as doing that as a startup company based in uh, Silicon Valley. Um, um, so there's actually, you know, you might ask why, why go to the moon? Um, there's actually many reasons. Um, but, um, you know, one thing that's really interesting is that our conception of the moon has radically changed. Um, when most people think of, uh, of the moon, first of all, it's something beautiful that we see and we have a personal connection to it. Uh, you know, it's one of those distant things, but it's the brightest thing that we see in the sky. It's absolutely amazing and inspiring. Um, and then we think about what it really is. What is that moon? What is it moon and why, you know, why should we actually care? Um, a lot of people think that it's basically a dead, dry rock. Um, just some kind of big set of chunks of you know, dead rocks. Um, as Zoe was saying, uh, we probably thought that uh, Pluto was also completely dead and dormant and boring, and it turns out to be a lot less so. But there's been some amazing developments that have happened and over completely changed our thinking about the moon really in the last uh, 15 years. And um, so the moon can really be thought of as the eighth continent of planet Earth. Okay, And um, <laughs> it's really interesting. And in fact, um, you know, the moon... I would say now is more accessible for us to go and, and you know, access the moon, ultimately uh, make the moon part of our uh, Earth system. It's more accessible than the New World was at the time of the earlier explorers. I mean, they thought that the world was flat. They thought that it was basically actually sea monsters. And literally, you would go and many people would, would die. So um, the moon is right there. Um, and it's an incredible resource for us as our planet. So basically, we have an eighth continent. It's just sitting there. It's one sixth the size of Earth. Um, and um, so it's eighth continent, um, you know, it's, it's devoid of, um, of life, but it's extremely rich in untapped resources, and we didn't really think about that until recently. So um, everything that you see on this list, platinum, all the platinum grade metals, um, you know, including gold, all these things are there in, in really vast supply on moon. Um, if you look at, uh, this is a uh, this is a chart, you know, showing the different kinds of chemical, uh, chemical compositions on the moon. Um, so it's actually also, you know, the gateway um, to the rest of the solar system. And this is also really interesting. So we've previously thought, uh, when I said the moon is, is dead and dry and there's really nothing that interesting. So it turns out that asteroids have been crashing into the moon um, forever, right? The Earth has been, the Earth has been, um, uh, was molten um, for the whole time. Sorry, the Earth has been, the Earth has been, um, was molten until about a billion years ago. Um, and the moon, the entire time, has basically been, you know, solid. And asteroids hit Earth and moon all the time. These asteroids are actually bringing incredible resources. Um, many of the resources we have on the surface of the Earth came from asteroids. Okay. Um, if you think about it, the Earth was molten, and so when the asteroids were anything that was hit, any metals that were on the Earth's surface initially kind of sunk into the core. Um, but actually the moon has not been molten, and so all these asteroids have basically left their mark and things just stay on the moon. So the incredible amount of resources there. Another really interesting resource, I think I talk about it here. So these resources is all of this, all, there could be more platinum grade resources on the moon than in all the mining reserves of planet Earth. It's very interesting. Um, and um, the moon, you know, we've learned now that from all these lunar samples um, that, you know, learned all these incredible things. And the most interesting study is of water on the moon. Again, it's not a dry rock. Um, the, um, asteroids, uh, comets bring um, all kinds of interesting things. And there are deep craters on the moon, um, especially at the poles. Uh, they're cold traps. They never see the light. They never see the sun. So they're actually extremely cold. <clears throat> and they actually trap frozen water. Um, and now we've actually had um, missions. NASA and other countries have done missions. And we've discovered that there is actually um, as much water, ice on the moon as there, as there is in the Great Lakes. So that's actually vast amounts of water resources. Um, water is interesting for many reasons. Um, and um, it's actually, we'd say, the oil of the solar system. So we think of it as good for life support, but actually, which is great. So if you want to go and colonize space, you're going to need water somewhere. Um, the moon actually has it in abundant supply. But also, um, the, element, the components of water, hydrogen and oxygen, can be mixed together to form rocket fuel. 
is hydrogen peroxide. It's actually a very good rocket fuel. So the moon becomes essentially a, uh, an oil depot, an oil station. You can go and extract out this water, um, bring it from, uh, you know, from the moon out in ultimately into Earth orbit, um, and set up a fuel depot. At that point, all you need to do to get anything anywhere in space is have the mass to launch directly from Earth to low Earth orbit. Normally, much of the cost of a space mission, um, especially if you manage a mission to Mars, most of what you're carrying is going to be rocket fuel. And you have to carry the rocket fuel all the way for the whole mission. And if you want to do a return mission, you're generally carrying the rocket fuel for the initial distance and back, and the fuel to carry that fuel and so on. So most of the cost of any of these missions is, and the complexity driven by the cost is, this, uh, is the fuel. If you can just stand up just enough to get into low Earth orbit, and then refill completely, then you have access, low cost and cheap access to the entire solar system. And then you can set up more infrastructure and build more. And there's even a sort of a uh, kind of an exponential uh, ability if you send a small amount of infrastructure to start mining the moon, this water, you can then use that to bring that fuel back and make the cost of your next missions cheaper, and then you can send more infrastructure and you can double and double and double. So it really is at hand once we start getting into the business of, of you know, extracting water from the moon that we can open up energy resources for all of space uh, exploration and space development quite rapidly. So, um, so this ultimately is going to lead to a moon rush, and uh, we're hoping to usher this in. Um, we're a commercial space company, and um, we're basically in this massive opportunity in opening up lunar resources, among other, other great reasons to go to the moon. Um, and um, we're building robotic spacecraft. So initially, it's, it's unmanned. And our goal is to basically be this initial system that will go out and help to discover, explore um, at extremely low costs. Um, and ultimately, we'll start returning samples in later missions, um, and then you know, ultimately helping to you know, mine and harvest these resources. Um, oh, I'm sorry, and we partnered with um, NASA. So NASA is both a, a partner, main provider, major provider of technology and knowledge uh, for us, and also a customer. Um, NASA is increasingly turning to commercial space. Um, you've heard about NASA funding um, sort of SpaceX and now buying um, launches up to uh, space station and so on. Um, and we're really viewing this as a, the first step. Now NASA is actually opening up to commercial companies in um, going into outer space. Um, and um, there's a new challenge. Uh, Google has sponsored um, a new X Prize um, called the Google Lunar X Prize for um, basically the first teams uh, to go and land spacecraft on the moon and send back HD video. So with that, I'm going to show you here a video that talks about the Google Lunar X Prize. Hopefully that will work. I'm an orphan of Apollo. So as a little boy, I was watching this happen, these ghostly gray figures bouncing around too slowly on another world. And I knew that those were people up on the moon. That's my co-founder and our CEO. Continent. It's right there and we can see it. Heading into high school and then university, I expected, you know, where's my space station? Where's my moon colony? What we're doing here, the Google Lunar X Prize, weren't realizing this future. The X Prize was announced at the very tail end of the summer of 2007. Tons of teams came in to compete. The challenge that we have is to demonstrate that what we do is viable. We're doing something that's never been done before. We're landing a private spacecraft on the surface of the moon. These are incredibly brilliant people who are actually going to change society. The moon will unlock the solar system because it's a gas station in the sky. We're heading into a new era of commercial space. Because of what you have done, the heavens have become a part of man's world. $30 million is the purse of that $30 million. $20 million is the first prize for the first private team to land on the moon and send back high definition imagery, video, and data from the landing site and from 500 meters away. I think the most resource that we need is, I don't know, engineers with magical power. We joke that we won't sleep until we get to the moon that's part of the lifestyle. All visionaries are going to ask for ridiculous things. This is the ultimate passion that I have, but it has a downside that I will not see my son as often as I would like to. We're standing on the shoulders of giants trying to do something that's only been done by superpowers. Because the problem statement is so large, it will become imperative that teams collaborate. Space is for everybody. Space exploration is not just a one nation effort. It brings together the whole planet. Unless we do something great next, we're going to sit in the same stagnant place that we are. This could be the one epoch where all of human generation would say that was the moment that we became a multi world species. Looking upwards is looking to a new frontier. It's attainable by humans, but completely.
completely improbable. And to me, there's beauty in that. There's human hope. This is the real adventure that you can have. Until that stops being fun, we're all on board. Okay, so that's the overall Google and Rex Prize, and now uh, what are we doing here? So um, <clears throat> we're building a really a breakthrough, versatile robotic space system. Um, it's our own system. Again, as I said, it's building on uh, technology developed by NASA and exploiting and harvesting technologies that have been developed through you know revolutions in cell phones and qubits. Everything else that's happening in technology is enabling small companies like us to actually do this. Um, so um, um, initially, is our MX1 Scout class um, micro launcher. And then we're basically having, sorry, sorry MX2 is our um, lunar lander. Um, and then we're also going to be building smaller version of that lunar lander um, that can actually be a lunar return capsule. Um, and ultimately, then we'll basically be expanding this out to more and more pieces of the space infrastructure. So starting with our, our micro lander and launcher, um, this is, uh, well, I mean, basically, it's a, it's a self-sufficient satellite system. Um, with um, landing abilities. And landing abilities are basically rockets and retro rockets and its own ability to land. So um, the core system is the same kind of system that you can use to um, build orbiters and space probes and so on. Um, but then the actual landing, the moon is actually quite hard to land on. Actually, I should say the moon is pretty easy to land on. Um, it's really hard to land on without crashing. <laughs> Um, and you'd have to be fully autonomous because the, you're you know, controlling these things in, in split second timing um, and it's very precise. So you basically have to make the machine with all of its own logic um, playing that, like if you ever play that Lunar Lander video game where you have just these thrusters and you're trying to control your thrust, you've got to be just precise to make it work. Um, and um, we're actually excited about this, not only for the moon, but the same systems we're developing will support many of the other aspects that we'll need as we start thinking about building space infrastructure. Um, we can use this to um, you know, track and remove space debris. We can use it as a space tug to move things around in space, um, deploying a whole generation of new uh, CubeSats and so on. So a really versatile system. Um, so our first mission is aligned with the Google and Rex Prize, and uh, we're working to land on the moon in 2017. So it's coming right up. Um, and um, our second mission um, will actually deliver the world's first uh, lunar observatory um, uh, to the South Pole and Moon. So we've already built the prototype of that. Um, we have a customer, um, and it's really exciting. So that's going to be really neat. And then our third mission, uh, we'll be planning a sample return mission. Um, <clears throat> a, smaller vision, a smaller version of our same lander. So our lander will go and land, and it'll have a little mini lander. We'll then uh, take some space rocks or, you know, kind of moon rocks, moon dust, and so on, and then bring it back. Um, we did some calculations, and it's possible that just uh, the market for returning um, moon dust and moon rocks alone, um, you know, could be worth $1 billion for bringing back about sort of five, five kilograms. Um, it's something you can't actually buy on Earth, and it would be good for many, you know, in addition to just being interesting, it might be good for wedding rings and things like that. Um, literally, you could have sort of a new form of honeymoon, kind of everything. Um, I'm telling you that because uh, part of the challenge, there's a, a technological challenge of going to the moon, um, and then there's really a business challenge, right? And so how do you possibly be a startup company and get this all going so you can open up and have a long vision in, in space exploration? So figuring out what are the markets that are going to be, how do you take those first steps, and how do you get funded? And of course, the, you know, there's the technical questions, can you actually do it? Um, and then there's business questions, well, you know, investors want to know if, you'd, if you did that, then you know, how will we make a return? I um, mean, why do you care? So, um, so the, the interplay between those things is all... Uh, all in that challenge of addressing it. And the business ones are as formidable for a startup company you know, as the technological ones. Um, so um, we started working um, with NASA Ames Research Center, and um, we actually were repurposing the system they developed for LADEE, which was one of the lunar orbiter systems and the one that sent the probe in um, that let us know there was water ice on the moon. Um, and then we started working with um, NASA uh, Johnson Space Center in Texas, and um, they had developed, and NASA Marshall Spencer, they had developed um, the Mighty Eagle. And now we're basically taking that and graduated to that level, and we've been controlling with our software system, controlling that vehicle as a way of showing that our stuff can work. Um, and um, so this is the uh, private sector flight test collaboration, and I'll show you a video of that as a way of getting our driver's license for space. Do I need to do something? Here we go. Now 
verb sequence. I really love the, the, you know, the landing videos. It's so much fun. Um, we're just imagining how exciting it's going to be to actually have our, our mission land on the moon. I mean, it's just it's imagine. It's incredible. Um, so now, so as I said, that, um, that lander um, was a, ver a, vision, uh, a version developed by NASA. Um, and NASA's really open to collaborating. So it's been wonderful for us to harvest and piggyback on all that great work and with, that, with those great teams. Um, and now we're building our own. So we already demonstrated that our software control system can work to control that system and do the landing you just saw. Now we're building our own system. Um, it's actually smaller, cheaper, um, you know, and done on a startup budget. And we're still working with those same teams. <clears throat> and um, now uh, we've been selected by NASA uh, for their Lunar Catalyst program. So I was talking about NASA is now um, engaging in uh, you know, commercial space and funding people and thinking about how can NASA piggyback and take advantage of these sort of startup and private companies. So um, they're both uh, giving us funding um, and they're having a program where we're potentially going to be a candidate to actually deliver a cargo to the moon. There's actually about a billion dollars worth of experiments that scientists would like to do on the moon um, and there just has been the funding for it. But we're bringing the cost down by dramatic factor per launch. Um, and uh, now we've been doing a flight test of our own vehicle that we've been building at Kennedy Space Center. Um, that's, uh, that's the place where um, they've launched, you know, all these, uh, all this, the space shuttles. Um, it's also the place where they've launched um, all of the deep space probes in the whole history. So we're down a very historic building um, at, at that Cape. And our neighbors now are actually SpaceX and Jeff Bezos' Blue Origins company. So in really good company as that be as becomes a private and a commercialized space coast. So here's um, a video of doing our own uh, flight tests with our own system. So yeah, so in conclusion, that's the summary of where we are with Moon Express. Um, we've been doing our flight testing. We're building now. Our team is all now relocated out to the Kennedy Space Center. Um, 
and uh, we're in the middle of build phase. So um, watch this, uh, watch this, and hopefully in a couple of years um, we'll be seeing the videos. Um, and by the way, the, the system has to land on the moon and then send back because of the modern times has to be um, visible to everybody. So it will land. We'll be flying an HD camera um, and send back videos um, from the landing spot on the moon, um, showing everybody how how it works. Um, and then also we plan to open that up so that we can have people all over the world able to um, decide where you'd like to take pictures. So imagine being able to have, take pictures from our moon lander or places on Earth or whatever else you want to do. So uh, we hope to also create a great personal connection in a new way uh, to the moon. And again, it's a great timing to happen to be here talking about this just as we have a super moon, um, you know, super moon and a full eclipse of the moon tonight. Anyway, uh, thanks, Yola. So now we come to, to questions, and I think the way this will work is that uh, Barney's there, so why don't we have some questions for Barney now, uh, and then we'll, uh, uh, Zoe, uh, Zoe and uh, followed then by Harvey, and then we'll have our drinks. Um, so we've got some students around with uh, roving questions. You've got these white cards I think you can hold up, and some of you I think might already have uh, registered questions. So let's, um, okay, so we've got a question here, but I'm going to ask a question, which is up here, here we have one. So the microphone can come here. Yep. And I've got a question though. Um, what's, what's the thing we're going to be doing to celebrate the uh, Apollo 11 landing in 2019? Um, what, things, what do you think will, we, what, what will be the big event that year to celebrate? The 50th wow. anniversary? I don't, I, I don't know. Um, I, I know that um, we're, not, we're not planning to land at any of the Apollo sites. Um, initially. Um, it's possible that you can, but those are also protected, so you want to be really careful uh, for historical purposes. Um, but I mean, it's going to be really interesting because, you know, by that time we'll have actually now be fully engaged with commercial companies opening up the access to the moon. So it's, I mean, whatever it's going to be, it's going to be really fun. Will you be on the moon by then? Um, yeah, we plan to land in 2017. We may be in our second mission by uh, 2019. Oh, I'll pick his mic. Yeah. Hi. So you mentioned um, business and technological issues. Yeah. What about legal issues? Who actually owns the moon? Yeah, it's a great it's a great question. So actually, um, by the uh, there's the there was a moon treaty that wasn't signed, um, but there's an outer outer planets treaty, and the outer planet treaty says that basically the moon is like the open seas. Okay, um, the moon cannot be owned by any sovereign nation. So nobody owns the moon. Okay. Um, but, um, but just like the open seas, if you go fishing in the open seas, you don't own all the fish in the sea, but if you're fishing, you can keep the fish, and no one's allowed to mess with your fishing infrastructure when you're there. So um, there's plenty of room on the moon for everybody to go and, go and do stuff. The good news is that there isn't life on the moon, so there's no, nothing to harm. Um, but uh, yeah, so we go to the moon, and we, we can, everyone who goes to the moon, you can basically bring back moon rocks and samples, you can set up mining operations. Um, the moon, I think, is really going to be quite open for business. I have a question here. Yes, actually, mine was uh, very similar on the ethics of sort of mining, mining the moon. I mean, is there any protocols that govern it, and what stops the Chinese, for example, taking it all before we get there? Yeah. So right now, right now, I'm not aware that there's any actual protocols um, about the moon. Um, I would say that it, you know I'd rather people go and do mining operations on the moon than on Earth. So if it's a choice, you know, that would be great. So. We have a question at the front here. Uh, I was wondering if you've down-selected to a launch provider. A launch provider. Um, so, so we have many options. It's wonderful. When we were first starting the company, partly the reason we started the company is that um, SpaceX, you know, was now clear there was going to be lower cost options because it previous for a while was costing $100 million if you wanted to, to do a launch. Um, and we could see SpaceX bringing it down to about $50 million. Um, and it's kept on going down and down as more companies enter. And now in the last few years, there's been um, CubeSats. CubeSats are basically there's been really interesting developments. Um, people put so some of our colleagues actually said, well, you know, would an iPhone or an Android phone would that actually work in space? And normally space development is really really expensive because uh, there's all worries about radiation and special space conditions. And if they don't work, you've got to make things, you know, one-off, very expensive versions, or everything gets expensive. But um, if you could actually put up a cell phone and it worked, then you know that'd be great. So our friends did that and they showed that it actually worked. That opened the door for lots of low-cost, you know, CubeSats that could be high-functioning, Earth-orbiting, tiny little satellites. And now there's basically launchers coming to support the needs of getting lots of those CubeSats up in space. So the costs are coming down. Um, we're thinking now we can do it for $10 million a launch. 
Okay. okay, terrific. And we designed our system to be able to piggyback and launch on almost any launcher. So really, we, we feel very good about the launch costs coming down. Hi, um, in, in the uh, video of you testing your own system uh, last December, sorry, I'm here. Okay, there. Um, in the video of you testing your own system yeah. last December, uh, I noticed that there wasn't any of the uh, landing in that video. Yes. Um, was it just caught on the rope, or was it more hilarious than that? Um, actually, actually, it, w it was caught. Uh, yeah, it was caught. So, um, so, you know, we basically had to, you know, had to make the video the best video that we could at the time. We'd already shown that, the, uh, you know, that we knew that the software system would work. And there were some silly things around test stands. I mean, most of these things are just like the really, you know, it's not the exciting stuff. It's the mundane stuff that just gets in the way. Yeah. Over here. Mine's also about ethics. Um, you seem to be trying to solve the problem of us using up all our Earth's resources. Aren't the resources on the moon also finite? And wouldn't it be better to use the money to develop ways of using our Earth resources in better, more economical ways? It's a, it's a great question. Um, so let me give a, 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 personal, a personal answer to that. Um, I worked at NASA, and this is not so much about the ethics, but about the priorities. Okay. It's very counter to what we might be talking about here, but I worked at NASA uh, for a long time, and I really loved and had a great time. We were doing autonomous spacecraft, supported Mars exploration, mo rovers missions, and um, I actually had the personal feeling that there's so much to do on, on planet Earth um, that you know, I'm actually you know, less excited, even though I am excited about what we can do in space. You know, for the near term, there's just so much on Earth, and we don't even know what's, you know, what's really in the oceans, right? And we have wonderful things happening on Earth. So for my own personal priorities, I'm more actually concerned about how can we help Earth. Okay, um, but actually, um, two things about that. So there are finite resources on Earth, and um, the moon is actually, I think, a great low-cost way to create a lot of resources for us. Okay, so it's not an either-or. In fact, we're talking about relatively small amounts of money. I believe you could build the entire infrastructure to bring back resources from moon into Earth orbit, um, and also potentially to Earth for about $20 billion. And that's cost about a medium mine. So developed, you know, a medium mind developed in, in current times. So this is really at hand, and it's not either or. And then as far as, as, far as the work that we're doing, um, we're not taking government funding. This isn't a matter of government priorities. We're actually taking private funding. And the private funding is just any, any other exploration projects. You know, it's based on, um, on return on investment. Okay, so we've just got the last two questions. One, one here, yeah. yeah. Thank you. You may have answered a little bit of this already, but my question was, with this new era of commercial ventures, to explore and benefit from the moon's resources. What intentions or efforts are there already underway to coordinate this across the nations and protect the long-term sustainability of those resources? Um, so, so I talk about there are, these, there are these treaties about the actual ownership of, of property on the moon, and um, the most, most thought has been given to protecting the heritage sites um, where we've actually been before to the moon and those are precious kind of international, international resources. Um, as far as the actual resources of, of the, you know, the moon themselves, um, there's not really a sustainability issue um, because there is no life on moon. Um, it's completely you know, barren and there's no oxygen, there's nothing, no, you know, so basically people aren't really that worried about that right now. Okay, well look, we've, in the interest of time, we've, we're going to move on uh, to Zoe. So thank you very much again for... Thanks.